Welcome to episode 159 of The Numbers Game. I'm Jace. I'm here with Nick and Marty. How are you going today, fellas? I'm excited. And I don't know when this episode is going to drop, but Valentine's Day is coming up. <laughs> and um, I've got a jealousy issue in the household where the dog, Penny Lane, will not let me touch my missus at all without <laughs> either going at me or my missus. Talk about yeah, you know, big jealousy issues. Don't know what I'm going to do. Don't want to put it down, obviously, but, you know, <laughs> intimacy is important to me. So got to work through it. Got to work through it. Nick, how are you going? Hope you're good, mate. Uh, yeah, good. Good. Just a bit windy outside, so I'm suffering a bit of <laughs> uh, bit of hay fever today. It's actually got me, so might be another coughing fit. But um, other than that, mate, yeah, um, fighting fit. Can't complain. Just getting ready for the footy season. It's coming. Uh, cricket's gone. Um, yeah, been loving being kept up to date with uh, your cricket, your cricket nights. Every cricket, every day's a cricket day for you at the moment. So, yeah, maybe maybe fill us in on that, mate, because you are very excited about it. But you're down the nets, down the nets after work every night now. Just you know, putting a few back over Charlie's head. Any updates? Every night at the moment, but he's loving it. He. Um, I think it's Lassif Malinga, who's a Sri Lankan bowler, um, coaches in June at Top Line out in Bayswater. And he's found out all about it. And he wants bowling coaching off, you know, a Sri Lankan legend. So, um, yeah, so I've I've got to sort that out now. Goodness me. Is he leaning towards um, fast, medium pace, um, wrist spinner, finger spinner? What's your... Yeah, he... He likes he likes pace. He likes bowling me. He loves that. But he's very interested in leg spin. So very interested. Um, so there's a there's a coach Lal who used to coach the Hong Kong international team. Um, I don't know how good Hong Kong are, but <laughs> <laughs> he's down at top line as well. So we're going to get some wrist spin lessons as well. So right into it. Sorry, Jace, we'll get to you in a minute. We're just, we're just talking about Charlie's uh, cricket career here. No, no, but all good. Our followers want to keep updates on Charlie, so I get it. That's fine. Yeah, and I'm just thinking, you know, being a uh, a young guy that's into the business side of things, uh, statistics, uh, chess, strategy, I'd, you know, he'd probably really love the the strategy of being a spin bowler and, you know, setting, setting batsmen up to, to, to take the wickets out. There's this – if you – Google it, well, get it on YouTube. There's this nine-year-old leg spinner in India. I don't know what his name is, but just look up nine-year-old leg spinner and he's an absolute freak and Charlie's all over it. He's just bowling adults, just (laughs) incredible. So, yeah, he's got his eye on duplicating that. So, yeah, watch this space, Australia. Oh, good. Don't worry about about the Shane Warne stand. The Charlie Martin stand's going to be – Next in line, so yeah, pretty cool. Jase, how are you, mate? Mate, good. Before we uh, just to, so listeners know what's on the horizon, we are doing a fight, a tear down. Well, resharing a tear down of F forty five, and then talking about the franchise space. But it's funny, you guys always get me thinking about random things. You know, Marty starts off with the dog and the misses, and and I, what jumps to my mind is that I have the same problem at home, but it's the cat like refuses to let me go anywhere near Casey. The cat is always there, sleeps on Casey's chest, sleeps cuddled into Casey. I'm like pushed into the corner of the bed, like less than a third of the bed. So I feel you, Marty. I feel you. And if you come up with a solution of how to- It's not right. No, it's not. And then also every time you guys start talking about cricket, I feel like I need to get back into it. So maybe uh, end of this year, once all my marathons are out of the way, London, Gold Coast, Chicago, I might rebirth the cricket career. But yeah, anyway. well, Marty's joining um, the Supers, so Oof. there could be, if you're happy to get down to the Yarra Valley there somewhere, you might be able to jump in his team. Marty. Captain coach of his last team, so he'll go straight to the top of the new one as well, so you, you know. Jase, you might have to put some, you might have to put some grey tint in your hair though, just to, <laughs> and bring out a walking stick as you bring your cricket bag down, just Actually, to, you know, compete with the elites over this is, fifty. This is my kind of time. This is my kind of scene. Then, if if you're telling me that I, I could be good in this group, I, I'm, I'm I'm interested. But speaking of being good, speaking of uh, being interesting, let's uh, fire up and and talk about. Uh, you know, I've, I've brought something to the team. Big shout out up front to Jason Andrews, who's a fellow accountant. He does these interesting segments on LinkedIn where he tears down businesses. And the reason this kind of popped back up into mind, so by background, I want to talk a bit about F45. 
Now, to talk you guys into what got this on my path, I keep an eye on businesses that are, you know, up for sale and then businesses that are going to liquidation. And over the last year, almost every second week, I've seen an article pop up that talks about another F45 in Australia goes into administration or liquidation. Another F45 shuts down. Another F45 rebrands and changes to something else. So it's kind of um, constantly been on my radar. And then the number of businesses for sale, about six months ago, there was about 50 F45 businesses for sale around Australia. And now, you know, my recent search this morning in prep for this episode had over 100 F45 businesses for sale in Australia. So, you know, a couple of episodes ago, we started talking about supply and demand. And, you know, for that, it was Super Bowl ticket prices going up. All of a sudden, if you've got 100 F45s for sale, Nick, what is the price happening there? Uh, going going down. Correct. Going down. So I thought maybe that was a true question. No, 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 no <laughs> trick questions here. So um, the reason for the shout out, Jason Andrews, I've pulled up his uh, article that was actually then published onto smartcompany.com.au. Really interesting read. I'll share a couple of tidbits out of that. But um, my own, uh, I guess, background to you guys, you know, F45 was a, a massive Aussie success story for for quite a long time. You know, you couldn't drive through a suburb without seeing an F45. Anyone who did F45 would rave to you and tell you that they were into F45 and they were doing hit and they went to the gym this many times per week. And Maybe they look phenomenal too because they dropped some kilos because they were, they were getting into the gym way more regularly than they may usually due to, I guess, the F45 model, which we'll get to. But so back in oh, the background for F45, just quickly, so that I can spend more time talking numbers because, you know, I know how excited that is, exciting that is for Marty. 2013, Rob and Luke launched F45. Uh, the first studio was Paddington, Sydney. And... Basically, F45, as the name suggests, 45-minute workouts, it's HIT, so high-intensity interval training. Um, concept blew up, and within, I think, eight-year eight year time, they launched over 2,200 franchises across 60, 60 countries worldwide and had, you know, Hollywood A-listers like Mark Wahlberg get involved in investing into F45. So part of this, you know, rapid expansion, um, they did an IPO in 2021. So it's an initial public offering. Now, as an Aussie business that had then had more of its success expanding into the US, I think the numbers were around, there was 500 to 550 franchises in Australia. And then in a shorter period of time, there was over 800 franchises that popped up into, into the US. So it made sense for them. I'm sure they had advisors and numbers, people telling them where it made sense to list and they were listing on the NASDAQ. Um, so through this process, they raised $300 million at a valuation of $1.4 billion. So before I go any further, thoughts on a rapidly expanding F45 gym. Do you, have you guys ever been to F45? Just want to take a little break there before I pummel into some more exciting info. You guys done an F45 class? I have. I came to you why or where <laughs> because I, I've never, and the reason I'm saying this, I was never a member. I think I did one in Bali. I think we were looking to train somewhere in Bali and there was an F45. So I went and did a class. Yep. Was Maybe. there one in Bali? Yep. Seminyak had an yep. F45. Yep. So yes, I have done one. Yep. yep. No, I, I haven't myself. I haven't been in a gym for 15 years, can't you tell? I didn't want to say anything, Marty, but uh, <laughs> you set yourself up for that one. No, no, all good. Yep. So um, also, I think I've done one F45 class myself, and I reckon that was traveling somewhere, maybe like a Byron Bay or something, just jumped in and, you know, smashed out a class or a couple of classes. Um, so the concept, I guess, there and, and the reason for its, its success from a membership point of view was the memberships were quite expensive. So, you know, you're paying $70 a week and what they said, like, even though it was a relatively simple workout, you know, you got in, you looked at a screen, you did some burpees or some mountain climbers, you had some kettlebells. What they were saying was because people were spending so much money on a membership to join part of a community and a cult, they were encouraged to go more times per week than they would if they were spending $10 a week on like, let's say at any time fitness membership. If you're only spending $10, you're more likely to go, ah, oh, I'm not going to go this week. But if you're spending $70 a week on your F45 membership, you've got to go to get value for money. And the more times you go, 
you start to see results. So that was a bit of the method of the madness behind F45's success. Now that's from a studios and memberships point of view. So you imagine the expansion, they've grown all over the world. They, as I said, the $1.4 billion valuation. Do you want to have a guess at what it's valued today, Marty, as I then expand into all the issues that they've faced? Oh, well, it sounds like it's dramatically <laughs> on the decline. Um, so I don't know, maybe one, one tenth, two tenths of what it was worth. Who knows? I don't know. Oh, one tenth is a pretty bloody good guess, Marty. Really? Current okay. valuation, $114 million. Okay, down wow. Down from $1.4 billion. So if you're talking Jeez, share dramatic. price, you, your share price at its peak was $17.28 and you're buying shares for 0 0.023 cents today. So, Jeez. you know, F45, you know, the challenges that they faced, you know, COVID-19 COVID pandemic was a big one. I mean, people realized that those kind of workouts you can do from the comfort of your own home. You know, if you bought a kettlebell and a, and a dumbbell set, and you have those all these workouts at home. Then you've got the competition. BFTs exploded. Peloton's going mental. You've got Pilates and strong fitness studios. You've got FitStop. There is just so much competition in the workout space. And then also running. I mean, I know Greg and I run and we talk about it a bit, but it seems like there's more people running and getting into running than ever before. I don't know if you guys noticed that as well, but so mm. F45 not only had challenges through the pandemic, but there's also increased competition. You then have oversaturated markets and decreasing size of franchise zones. So you can imagine with F45 selling so many franchises that all of a sudden the customers are competing with the F45 in the next suburb. If you think Melbourne between, you know, Sandringham, Black Rock, Hampton and Brighton, if you've got an F45 in all four of those suburbs, you're probably advertising, marketing and targeting a pretty similar clientele through that area. Yes. Yes. Thank you for answering the, <laughs> the semi-rhetorical question. So I guess effectively, you know, what I wanted to talk through was a little bit about what made F45 such a success from a numbers point of view at franchise level. So one of the things F45 did extremely well was not just make money on the franchise fees. So to sell the franchise, the brand, the playbook of how to do it, but also the amount of money they made on the equipment and merchandise sale as part of that. So anytime you want to increase your equipment, buy another dumbbell, get some um, barbells and whatnot, everything was F45 branded and had to be purchased through the, the franchise all. So you imagine from a sales point of view, not only were they getting a franchise fees being generated by your initial purchase price of your franchise, then your ongoing percentage of revenue but then also the upfront and ongoing equipment sales of every time you wanted to buy a piece of equipment for your gym. So, you know, F45 continued to grow in that way, ridiculous margins on all of that. And then you start to think, well, these business owners who are buying these franchises compared to, you know, the, up, the po other ones popping up like your BFTs, your Revels, your Fit Stops that are going everywhere – you're now with increased competition comparing, well, how much am I paying F45 and what am I really getting? Um, on the other side of that, you know, you've got your issues. Well, I mean, do, do you guys, do you guys, you know, any, any issues or thoughts from a franchise point of view um, in that aspect? I mean, it seems like there's a fair bit of handcuffs involved into, and I guess, you know, leveraging, taking a lot of money off franchisees, trying to make a living versus and the big franchise or up the top makes all the money and all these businesses seem to be going bankrupt and into liquidation. I always get concerned on that fast paced growth. Mm. You know, is the franchise or purely making money off the franchise, you know, franchise entry fee and then obviously the equipment being sold, they're making margins on that. For me, it always comes down to is the franchisee running a really profitable business through what the franchisor has set up. I, I mean, that's always a testament to how successful overall it's going to be. But some franchisors, from what I've seen in, in franchising over the last 25 years or so, it's all about that speed to market and to get as many, you know, as many areas, you know, sold off as quickly as possible. But Again, some of the more successful ones I've seen have established a franchisee, made it very profitable and used that blueprint to duplicate that. So it sounds like they obviously there was a need in the market. 
Uh, they were trying to build a culture that was unique. Uh, but again, when you say F45 to me, even though I knew it was around, and even it's so saturated now with different franchises now, I'm not quite sure what the point of difference is that would win my money. You know, if I was making a decision to go to a gym, I'd probably end up just at a gym, right? Because unless something really stood out. So so were the franchisees winning? Um, was there pressure on the franchisees in the business model? And is that why it's all crumbling? It's like a house of cards. Yep, yep. And look, the the beauty, I mean, this smart company article and, and the way Jason Andrews unpacks it, there's so many different dot points I want to ramble into. Um yeah, and it's actually mind blowing. I'm hoping one day we end up with a Netflix documentary on what happened to F45, a bit like the WeWorks and all those kind of things. So, um, just on the franchise numbers as well, the other one, you know, anyone, how do I word this in a more succinct way? In Australia, we love franchises. There's there's 1,200 different franchises to choose from. Um, if you go to Franchises Australia and have a look. And there's like 800,000 franchise businesses. You know, you think Subway's a franchise, Jim's mowing, you know, some McDonald's and Hungry Jack's are franchise owned, um, franchisees, and they, they own and run the stores. Um, so, you know, any, any number of businesses out there can be a franchise and some of them work really, really well. And, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of, you know, respect that goes to the franchises that are doing really, really well and supporting their franchisees. But I always say to clients who come in saying, hey, I'm thinking about buying into a franchise, you know, buying my own franchise. And one of the things is looking at the the uh, structure of the fees you need to pay. Are they flat fee? Are they a percentage of revenue? What kind of contractual obligations are you? Do you have for refurbishments of your fit out, you know, contributions to marketing fund? There's so many little T's and C's and it's always recommended to get a good lawyer on your side as well when you're doing this, not just an accountant. But the example in F45 your typical franchise fee, depending on your patch, was you know one thousand to three thousand dollars a month. But as the business grew and you hit your revenue targets, it became a percentage of revenue. So if all of a sudden you know at three thousand dollars a month, you were paying thirty six thousand dollars a year for your franchise fees, and then you had to buy all the equipment. Once you hit your revenue target and you went up, let's say you grew your gym memberships to a million dollars a year. Next thing you're handing over eighty thousand dollars in uh, franchise fees rather than 36000 you were paying the year before when you were under the revenue target. So you were almost limited in your, you know, your desire to grow your business because all of a sudden your margins were being hit. So that was one of the major things that, that happened in that area. And that's, you know, then when you compare to the other potential franchises out there these days, that's why the franchises have stopped growing to the numbers that they were. Then there's the, I guess, the market um, noise that was out there. So Mark Wahlberg invested. He got a pretty decent stake in F45 pretty early on. So he invested, uh, I've got the numbers here. He invested $100 million into F45 at a valuation of $450 million two years before the IPO. Now, once the IPO happened, obviously he made a pretty good return. He got about a 4X uplift on his 100 million. So um, once it IPO'd, his shares were worth four times what he put in. Then after it IPO'd, he made two major sales for $6 million worth of shares in tranche one, $6 million worth of shares in tranche two, right when the company was still kind of valued up and before it made any major announcements about its downturn in sales targets. Now, once all of his sales, it's a pretty steep downward slope after Marky Wahlberg got out. Now, not saying Mark had insider information, just saying that from an outsider public perspective, all of a sudden you start to get whispers and noise around what was really happening at F45. The CEO stepped down, the CFO stepped down, the noise continues. And then you've also got public figures, brand ambassadors and influencers that were working with F45 that then came out. David Beckham said something like along the lines of he was owed nearly 19 million US dollars for a series of broken contracts as part of being a brand influencer and some of the marketing contracts. So then if you imagine legal battles, you've got David Beckham's legal team suing F45. Um, Greg Norman came out and said he was owed money by F45. So and the down, the poor, you know, the thing that I really upsets me when I work with these some of these franchisees that have paid money to run F45 gyms is it's all out of their control. 
overall, ultimately, at the end of the day, they're still got to pay their monies to F45, um, the franchise. They've still got to buy their equipment through F45. They're contractually obliged. But the popularity of F45 with all the negative uh, press means that people are looking for alternatives of where they train. Now, not saying the everyday Aussie punter cares about what's happening in the news, but Sometimes there's all these different touch points of things that you read and see that would make you not necessarily trust a brand as much as what you would in the past. And that for me is one of the biggest things you buy when you buy a franchise is you're buying the brand value. Thoughts on all of that? And were you aware of um, how much was going on in F45 land? You've probably seen a bit of this pop up along the way. Oh, look, uh, I wasn't aware to the extent. Um, <clears throat> I did know that a lot of them were closing down. Um, mm. But... Yeah, like I'd, I'm, you know, and this could be a subjective view. So I'm, you know, open to everyone thinking I'm very subjective. I wouldn't get go nowhere near any fitness franchise, F45, whatever you want to call it. Like for me, anything that's easily duplicated, that's dependent on people's budgets, and that's easy to cancel um, when things are tight, um, that is very habit dependent. Um, and can also be seen as a fad. Um, let's be honest, fitness, fitness things are fads, diets are fads. There's always a new way to be fit or a new method of training that's, that's a fad. <clears throat> I just think, um, I just, I think if you're an investor, I think any kind of fitness um, franchise is a recipe for disaster, unless you can make, Unless that's what you really want to do, which is fine. Some people want to do that. And then you can make that work without the franchise if something goes wrong. No problem. But for me, if I'm going into a franchise, I'm looking at, okay, who's been around for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? So I'm looking at McDonald's, right? And I know the barrier to entry there is very high as a franchise owner. Um, but I'm looking at um, you know, necessities, food, things that people need. Um, the things that people can't go without uh, before I'm buying a franchise because I really want that franchise to do for me something that I can't do. Um, you know, I can't be, I can't advertise and market like a McDonald's. I can't be a McDonald's. Um, so I think if I want to set up a fast food chain, I'm going to have far better success with a McDonald's. But if I'm an F45 that's been around not that long, is growing really quickly, Anyone who knows business knows that growth costs a lot of money, um, and there's some other. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, fitness franchises out there at the moment who are growing. Um, I would not go near any of them. I, I would seriously consider what I could do personally um, without them if, if if I chose to go down that that path. Um, and I wish um, maybe we can come back with some research on this, Jason, in a later episode. Cause we haven't had time to do that, but. Yep. I'd love to go through a list of some other fitness franchises that have been and gone in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know, I'm guessing, but um, I reckon there'd be a lot. I, I reckon there'd be a lot and it's because easily du duplicated. It's a budget thing. When people don't have the money, it's one of the first things they can get rid of. You can't get rid of certain insurances. You can't get rid of your mortgage. You can't stop doing your tax, but you can drop uh, your gym membership. And they're so habit dependent. Yeah, there's a new influencer that comes out and starts to um, promote a new way of training and that becomes the next thing. The best thing that's probably stood, stood, uh, the, test of time, stood the test of time that I can think of is um, lately has been CrossFit. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if that works as a franchise model or not. I know it's just a method of training, but that that seems to still be around. But these, these brands and these uh, flashy brands, and there's a few more coming up now, um, I don't know. I just, I just, I struggle to think a lot of them are going to be here in 10, 15 years. No, that's a great question. The other thing you could ask yourself is a lot of the times the franchise fee into those types of industries are quite substantial. Like, could you create your own brand for half the cost? Mm -hmm. Now, it takes a bit of work, but then you've got a unique point of difference that's linked to you as opposed to being generic across a brand as well. Now, if you've got the ability to do that, you might have something a bit more sustainable as long as the numbers stack up behind it and you could cherry pick in your investigations as to what some of them do well, what some of them don't do well as a, as a sort of business plan test case. Um, I just think you've got to consider that 
as well as if you're going into a franchise. But Nick hit it on the head. I just go, it's, it's yeah, it's handcuff arrangements. Even trying to exit that type of business, there are parameters in regards to the franchise or will you know delegate based on you trying to exit on their terms and it might on their conditions. So you hamstrung a lot of different ways and you don't want to get out of the nine to five to get a 24 seven and then not be productive and lucrative. You know, it, it's, it's, if you're making a call to go into business, you've got to think what's, what's your greatest return given the capabilities you have and, and making it work. We've seen it in our own industry, Marty, and oh, I'm not going to absolutely. mention franchise names, but most uh, franchises in our industry, if you ask the owners if they had their time again, 99.9% of them would say they would not go down the franchise path because they get stuck and they get stuck into a deal that's not as good as it should be. Um, but when you're stuck there and you've really got to start again to leave, it becomes too hard a decision to make because you know, you've built your life around <clears throat> that particular business. So, and, yeah. and they control your revenues sometimes in our industry as well. So when you do leave, you're not guaranteed to get you know, your passive revenue that you get paid on certain dealings and you know, lots and lots of uh, red flags to look out for. And you've got to do your research up front before you go into them, um, not just say, oh, this was bad on the back end. You, like you said, get a good legal team around it, um, lawyer, you know, accountant, like friends, family, you know, business people you know, um, just pressure test it. And if it's, if it's right for you, then great. But, oh, geez, I've seen a lot go, go amiss. Yeah. And I was going to say, look, one of the things, you know, you boys do a bit of obviously is mortgage broking and, and getting finance for people. And that was one of the other areas that was noted as being a huge issue of the, the future growth of F45 franchises is that all of a sudden the funding was pulled. Like anyone who came along and said, yep, I want to start an F45 franchise. And historically, you could fund the whole upfront or you could put in a deposit. Their, their financing company would help you fund the purchase of the F45. You could set it up and running. You could have a loan. You could have your, you know, call it a hundred grand loan for your hundred grand worth of franchise fees up front and your equipment. And you'd get your rent and you'd sign on the dotted line and away you'd go. You'd start advertising to bring customers in. And a lot of that would be funded by, you know, the finance company. As soon as that funding stopped because the risk was too high, um, all of a sudden that was where they slashed, you know, they, they told their investors at the IPO they were expecting to launch one and a half thousand new franchises over the coming years. And then they slashed that number to around 300 to 400 because the financing stopped. They weren't able to finance people to do it. So it relied on people rocking up with a bag full of cash to do it themselves. So again, anyone who's thinking about getting into a business and it's going to take a giant loan to go and purchase the business, the franchise, or start a business from scratch, you need to have your ducks lined up. You need to have your advisors on board and you need to have the right people around you to advise you to get this thing done properly because business is not not easy. And even when you've got a recipe for success, a proven, apparently proven model, a brand and marketing and advertising sorted, it's still not a guaranteed plan for success. Here's a little tip too, is if you're looking at you know, buying an established franchise, you look at the financials of that franchise, but ask to see the financials of the core franchise or group as well. So you can see what their strength is, because again, no point having a decent you know, franchise that you've purchased if the house of cards is going to fall down. And if they don't want to give you that information, again, there's a red flag straight away. So it's just a little tip if you're doing that. Um, and that's just due, due, due diligence. Did I say it? Due diligence. But that's, that's all that is to protect yourself. And you want autonomy. You want independence and control over your financial future in business. And sometimes you know, in franchising that can be taken away from you even when you're doing well. So you just got to weigh it up. Yeah. And, and you know, Jase, we're, we're talking about the listed entity here, right? Mm. What we're not talking about is young people and mums and dads who probably borrowed anywhere between 250 to 500K to set an F45 up from a, you know, a bond for rent, sign lease agreements, um, fit outs, which have to be in line with the F45 brand. Um, generally have to have a specific fit out person fit them out. Um, <clears throat> these people are carrying debts to run these businesses. So I, I would encourage people to say, okay, well, what does it look like if I go down the franchise path versus 
if I do this for myself? Now, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to say, well, I'm not going to grow as quick because I'm not going to have that brand. I'm not going to have the, the marketing behind me. But you're all also not going to have the cost. So you know, look at, well, what if I did this organically? No, well, number one, could I do this organically myself, grow a little bit slower with a lot more costs? Now, you might grow slower, but you might find your end result being your net profit is more. Or is there another business out there um, that I can take over? Is someone already doing this? Is there, a, is there a gym somewhere where there's an older owner who wants to get out? It's got a decent client base. I know I can go in there and you know, I'm thinking about the year 2024. I know I can go in there and put a couple of ice baths and a couple of saunas and you know the things, I can make more money out of this place. So just look at alternatives and don't think because you see a flashy brand um, behind a particular, um, well, it doesn't just have to be fitness, uh, but business, that that's the only way to go forward and, and build a business. And sometimes a big brand and more revenue doesn't mean net, more net profit. And you'd know that better than anyone, Jace, because you've yep. seen so many of them. Um, and, you know, you want to get a really good understanding of, you know, how a business is trading. Show me someone who's been trading for 10 years. Show me someone who's managed to then sell the business and actually retire versus, um, you know, in 10 years they can't do anything with it and their memberships are going backwards. So um, lots of DD to be done, being due diligence. And we talked about this in previous episodes in regards to merchant fees on your money in the digital age. You know, if that $100 gets clipped, you know, if with merchant costs and various different costs throughout the process, that $100 is only worth maybe 70 bucks, right? And that's the same as as you know when you go into a franchise so you have to then think about you know what value are you getting for that thirty dollars and is that in some way you know amplifying your position uh to what you could do yourself because you're going to get that full hundred bucks yourself time and time again and it compounds so yeah I, it's funny just talking about it today yeah. i'm going i actually i'm not a franchise advocate at all We're, even I didn't. I was probably impartial and neutral until we had this discussion. But the more I think about it over time, and various people that have gone into them, uh, I think it's good if you're just buying a job. If you just want to buy a job, and you know you're getting a patch, you get the marketing, you're not really entrepreneurially on, orientated. I think it can work from that proviso. But if you really have an entrepreneurial flair and you want to build a business and you want to expand upon a business and duplicate your own brand, um, that's going to be a much more value down the track. But you've got to be that type of person too. So I see where it fits. And it's interesting, like I've seen, and this, is, this reminds me, I was coaching a, a mortgage broker and they went into one of the major franchises and they came out of financial planning to go into mortgage broking and they wanted systems set up. They weren't confident in going out on their own and establishing a brand. They wanted that support and they were happy to pay the fee and they earned okay money. And I'm sitting there going, oh my goodness, you're only getting paid half of what we would get paid mm. ex you know, external to this franchise and only a portion of the passive trail that you would get on a loan here. And, and I know that franchise has changed its dynamic since then um, to give more away. But I go, I just couldn't, couldn't comprehend it in my mind that someone would give up over half their revenue um, for the sake of a brand that you put on the front door. It just, just didn't make sense to me. 100%. Well, I don't think this will be the last time we talk about uh, businesses and franchises and what works and what doesn't. And I, I am interested in what you said, Nick, about, you know, over the last 10 years, w which businesses came and went in the franchise, or especially in the fitness space. So we'll uh, come back to you and report back on that. But for those listeners out there, if you do know someone who may be struggling in business and things aren't going to plan, the best thing you they can do is speak to an advisor, speak to an expert, get somebody in their corner that can help them out of this situation. Um, you know, 
know, we, we, Nick, Marty and I deal with uh, all different things all day, every day. So we're always happy to help and, and can be reached out to um, at the numbers game online, um, whether it's LinkedIn to us three straight connect or whether it's through our socials or hello at the numbers game podcast.com.au. We're here to help. We're here to serve. We love helping business owners. And this has just been a bit of an unpack of an interesting uh, business model at the moment, but there's plenty of interesting ones out there. So we've got you back until next time. If you're running a franchise really successfully, let us know. We want to act, actually, I'm serious. If if you know of people that are running successful franchise, let us know what they are, who they are. Because uh, again, it's only a perspective that we're sharing here today. So we want to learn too. So yeah, hit us up. Game over.